Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to this uh, Wednesday's uh, FRCS teaching. The presenter uh, today is um, Rishi Deer. He is a consultant upper limb uh, surgeon in Harlow. Uh, he's very active FRCS uh, tutor. He, he runs um, lots of courses, he teaches a lot of courses, and he runs his own course um, called Let's Talk Dr. Blitz course. He's quite um, a very good, um, uh, excellent FRCS teacher, and we're very happy to have him uh, with us. Um, we also have other um, mentors here. We have uh, Shwan, uh, Ranjit, Abdullah, Fuad, um, uh, Munir, Anwar um, with us to support the session. Um, Amfiras, um, I will be moderating this. Um, we'll try to answer all your questions and to try to get you actively involved. Um, so please, if anyone wants, there will be Viva, and I will urge you all to um, use um, this session um, to have a Viva experience with Rishi. It will be invaluable experience um, and, and um, make the best out of it. So if anyone wants to take part in the Viva questions, there won't be many. There will be probably only two or three. So if anyone wants to take part, please um raise the hand symbol next to your name on the group on the participant list or um, send me a message uh, and i will um, put you on the list so please uh, ex express your interest as soon as as possible um again uh, just to re um, reiterate that if anyone wants a cpd certificate please get in touch with me um, and i will get this uh, sorted for you and the, uh, the video will um, kindly, uh, Rishi agreed for us to make it available to you guys later on. And as usual, we don't record the lecture, we don't record your uh, Viva answers. Okay, so without any further ado, I will um, leave you with the Rishi now. Thank you for having me, Firas, and thank you to all the mentors. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, lovely to meet you all. Um, hope you're all uh, not suffering too much with this coronavirus. And I hope to teach you tonight about nerves and also nerve injuries. Um, I'll try and make it as relevant to FRCS as possible. So tonight we're going to look very briefly at nerve anatomy. We're going to look at nerve injuries in particular, how do you classify them and a mechanism for dealing with them as well. And then we'll try and look at some common viva scenarios as well. So let's start with nerve anatomy. Now the nervous system itself is broken down into three main parts. There's the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord. There's the peripheral nervous system, which essentially relays information from the periphery to the brain and vice versa. And then there's the autonomic system, which is responsible for sympathetic and parasympathetic function. And this is the peripheral nervous system is really the focus for the exam. This is what you're going to mainly be tested upon. So the basic functional unit in the nervous system is the neuron, which consists of a number of parts. So you essentially have a cell body and the cell body is kind of the chemical factory. It contains a nucleus. It contains a cytoplasm, which is also known as the axoplasm and various constituents such as vesicles, microtubules and the axoplasmic reticulum. And that's mainly needed to maintain the physical and physiological well-being of the axon. So the axon itself is where the impulses travel down to the end terminal, where they then communicate via synapses with other nerves. And the axon may be surrounded by a myelin sheath, which is a fatty layer. Now, the way that I think about it or break it down is into neural and non-neural tissues. So neural tissues are things like the cell body, the axon, the dendrites, which give a greater surface area for impulse transmission, and also the axon terminal. Whereas the non-neural tissues are things like glia. And what these do is these essentially are bits of connective tissue which nourish and support the axons. So glia within the central nervous system are known as oligodendrocytes. And within the peripheral nervous system, they're known as Schwann cells. And these have quite an important function because they produce this fatty layer which encases the neurons 
and can increase the speed of impulse transmission. And I'm gonna very briefly tell you about how this works in a second. So this is just some, a quick look at the peripheral nerve anatomy. And with the peripheral nerve anatomy, you essentially have a, um, a group of sensory fibers, motor fibers, and autonomic fibers, which are surrounded by connective tissue layers. The motor neuron is situated in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, which is the bit at the front, whereas the sensory cell body resides in the dorsal root ganglion, which is the bit at the back. And these cell bodies essentially project axons through the dorsal and ventral root respectively, and they join the spinal nerve as it exits the vertebral foramen, okay? Now, within these motor and sensory fibers, you've got a group of myelinated and unmyelinated axons. So what I mean by that is surrounded by a fatty layer or not surrounded by a fatty layer. And that's in the ratio of one to four. So you have many more unmyelinated axons than myelinated ones, okay? And these myelinated axons, I'll just come to that in a second, they have various points where they're interrupted called nodes of Ranvier. And one question a lot of trainees ask me, or they get asked in the exam is, why do impulses conduct more quickly in myelinated axons than unmyelinated ones? And it's often a question which is not well answered. So people mention this buzzword, saltatory conduction. And the, the, the question they often say is, oh, well, the impulses jump from one node to another because the fatty layer is impermeable to ions. But impulses don't truly jump. So that's not really a, a, an accurate representation of what happens. And so the buzzword that I want you guys to use in the exam is this thing of active and passive conduction. Okay? So active conduction is an energy requiring process. You get sodium and potassium ATPAs pumps, you get active transport, and essentially it's a slower process. Whereas passive conduction is a much quicker process. So what happens in, in um, myelinated axons is whenever you've got a node of Ranvier, you essentially have an impulse which is produced, an action potential, and that's an active process by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. However, because you've got these fatty layers, the impulses can't be produced across here. So essentially what happens is this action potential will begin to decay all the way across here. And that's a passive process. And then the next impulse will be produced at the next node of Ranvier. So that's a much quicker process because you get passive conduction. In the case of an unmyelinated axon, you have to keep producing these action potentials again and again and again and that's an energy requiring process so it's much slower so that's the real reason of what happens in saltatory conduction it's not that the impulses jump it's that you get passive decay of the impulse so it essentially acts as a capacitor an impulse is a circuit is being sent between the different nodes of Ranvier. So that's just a very quick aside. I wanted to mention that because that's a question I have seen asked in the exam and it's not answered very well. So just going back to peripheral nerve anatomy, at a macroscopic level, the nerve is surrounded by a number of coverings which you need to know about. So each axon is surrounded by a endoneurium. These endoneuriums then group together in bundles or fascicles and are surrounded by something called a perineurium. And then lots of these bundles group together to form a ner nerve trunk, which is surrounded by epineurium. So remember those three buzzwords, endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. And I suppose this is a clinical exam. It's an application exam. So the way that they may ask you it is, well, what's the relevance of these clinically? Well, the epineurium protects against compression. It's your outer layer of compression. And so you've got your epineurium, which protects against compression, whereas the epineurium and perineurium protect against stretch. And actually, the perineurium is the most critical layer in neurophysiology because it represents a blood nerve barrier, which is created between the inner layers of the perineurium and the endothelial cells, which are inside the endoneurium microvessels. 
So what I think of is this blood nerve barrier, which is your main resistance to compression. So that's why it's so important. Okay, so let's move on to nerve injury. And this is really the crux of my talk. Nerve injury can be caused by a number of different things. Most commonly is trauma. But I've created a little mnemonic, which is a nice way of remembering the etiology. So it's remembered by the mnemonic dating me. Diabetes and drugs, autoimmune causes, traction or trauma. And I've highlighted trauma because that's the most common cause. Inflammatory iatrogenic infection, neoplastic causes, general or systemic causes, motor neurone disease, and finally, electrical or thermal causes. So how do we classify nerve injury? Okay, so most commonly, my trainees will say to me, okay, classification, I remember Seddon and I remember Sunderland, all right? And Seddon basically breaks up nerve injuries into three main types, a neuropraxia or a conduction block, which essentially means that all the neural coverings are intact, but the nerve has been stretched or distorted in some way such that it's not working properly, okay? Then axonotmesis, which basically means that some of the neural coverings has, the axon's been cut, but some of the neural coverings are intact. So the endoneurium may have gone, the perineurium may have gone, but the epineurium is still intact. And then finally, neurotmesis, which means everything has gone, okay? Sunderland was a, a variation of this, which broke it into five main types, okay? So we've mentioned Seddon. Sunderland broke it into one to five, where one was again a neuropraxia or a conduction block, five was a neurotmesis, and two, three, and four were different variations of axonotmesis, depending upon which neural covering had gone. Okay, so a two basically meant that the um, basal lamina had gone, but the perineurium was intact. A three basically meant that the, um, sorry, two meant that the endoneurium had gone, but the basal lamina was intact. A three meant that the endoneurium and basal lamina had gone, but the perineurium was intact. A four meant that the endoneurium, basal lamina, and perineurium have gone, but the epineurium is intact. And five means everything's gone. Now, that's the, que that's the answer which most people give in the exam. I would use Seddon or Sunderland. But having worked on a peripheral nerve injuries unit in Stanmore, one thing that those guys always taught me is actually in reality, Seddon and Sunderland are not very useful clinically. Because if you think about it, clinically somebody comes in with a nerve injury and all we say is the nerve is not working. We don't know if the nerve has been cut or not. We don't know how many neural coverings have gone or we don't know if it's been a conduction block unless we look under the microscope, unless we excise a piece of nerve and look under the microscope. So actually, these are what I would call anatomical classifications. They don't offer much help clinically. So much better classification for clinical use is this one here called Birch and Bonnie. And what Birch and Bonnie did is they, and that's Rolf Birch who worked on the peripheral nerve injury unit at Stanmore. They basically broke these nerve injuries up broadly into two main types, a conduction block, which is the same as a neuropraxia and a degenerative lesion. And that's because they said, well, actually, clinically, you cannot differentiate between an axonotmesis and a neurotmesis. So they all should go under the same group of a degenerative lesion. Okay. And that's probably more useful clinically. So this is just a, a sort of slightly more complex table, just shows you the different classification systems. And I don't really want you guys to learn them in detail. Just remember what I said about Seddon, neuropraxia, axonotmesis, neurotmesis. Sunderland is one to five. And basically, Birch and Bonnie is a conduction block or a degenerative block, a lesion. Okay. So I'm now going to ex explain this in a bit more detail. And I want you to remember these two characters here, the earthworm and the bomb. This will revolutionize your understanding of conduction blocks and degenerative lesions. Okay. So the analogy that I think of, and I can't say this is my original thought. I worked on the PNI unit at Stanmore and the consultants there used to teach me about this. I have to thank them for this, but it's a great analogy. So the analogy that I think of is imagine if you have a lit bomb and you put the lit bomb in a puddle of water. 
the bomb will not go off because it's surrounded by a puddle of water. But if you dry the bomb and you take away the water and you light it, it will then go off and work. And this is very analogous to what happens in a conduction block or a neuropraxia. Essentially, the nerve is all intact, but it's been distorted. There may be a hematoma, there may be some scar tissue. Something is representing the puddle. It's stopping that bomb from going off. As soon as you remove that, or it may spontaneously resolve, then that nerve will start to work again. Okay, but if you leave a conduction block for a period of time, because essentially you get a compartment syndrome, you get disruption of the blood nerve barrier, which I mentioned before, between the perineurium and, and endoneurium, effectively that will progress on to become a degenerative lesion. The next one, is this concept of the earthworm. And the way I want you guys to think of it is imagine if you chop an earthworm in half, what happens? Well, what you find is the worm doesn't die. One part of it, the tail dies and shrivels away. But actually the bit which is connected to the brain regenerates and starts to grow a new tail, okay? And if you don't know that, try and find an earthworm in your garden and you have my permission to to practice that, okay? And, and that represents exactly what happens in a degenerative lesion or Wallerian degeneration. And I'm gonna just go on to explain that to you. So conduction block, the mechanism that I spoke of is this thing called the, the blood nerve barrier. And this was something that which I don't, didn't really understand until actually after I became a consultant, but it's all to do with this perineurium and endothelial cells. It's a barrier between those two. And the way that I think of it is it's a, selectively permeable barrier. So essentially these cells have got tight junctions which are impermeable to many different substances and there's no lymphatic vessels within either the endoneurium or the perineurium. So what that means is it, it creates an immunologically and biochemically privileged space for, for peripheral axons and supporting cells. So the two buzzwords I want you to remember are selectively permeable and then I want you to remember a privileged environment. That's the buzzword to remember. So what happens is when you compress this nerve, it gradually upsets this blood nerve barrier. It alters the pressure within the vessels, creating an internal compartment syndrome and essentially breakdown of the vasculature, which causes leakage. This then leads to accumulation of various proteins and ingression of inflammatory cells like lymphocytes and macrophages, which otherwise were not able to get in. And as a result, this initiates an inflammatory response and increases the permeability even further. So it's like a positive feedback cycle, okay? So compression upsets this barrier, lets in the inflammatory cells, the macrophages, the lymphocytes, these cause inflammation, they increase the permeability even more, positive feedback cycle, it all goes downhill, okay? So that's the way to remember it. Okay. Now, the only reason I put this slide in is because just I have heard of examiners saying to people, oh, well, how does the conduction block actually cause the problem? This is what it does. It's that selective permeable barrier, which creates an immune privileged environment. Okay. And it initially starts as a neuropraxia or a conduction block, and it later progresses to form Wallerian degeneration. So that's a little diagram of what I was saying. You start off with changes in the blood nerve barrier. You get compression and edema, which leads to thickening. And essentially what it does is it leads to localized nerve changes. You get an influx of these inflammatory cells, which otherwise were not able to get inside. They lead to increased permeability and start to cause breakdown in the nerve. And that will eventually progress to Wallerian degeneration. Now, this is the bit which I think is more interesting for you guys. So, my biggest buzzword when I teach is this word of compartmentalization. I compartmentalize everything, okay? So even if you go into your fridge, you talk about liquids and solids. Solids, which are vegetarian, meat. Everything you do now as part of your daily routine, compartmentalize, 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 okay? So with Wallerian degeneration, I break it up into three main parts. The cell body, the proximal segment, and the distal segment. So when you cut a nerve, imagine if you say, okay, I'm doing a, a carpal tunnel decompression. I accidentally cut the median nerve. And this is a viva question they might give you. What is happening at a cellular level? Well, basically, I would say to the examiner, I would break my answer up into three main parts. 
the cell body, the proximal segment, and the distal segment. So the first thing that happens is, just like the earthworm, the distal segment, because it's disconnected from the cell body, the nutrients can't get in, it will essentially shrivel up and die, it collapses. And all that is left behind are the Schwann cells. And they form these things called bands of Bungner, B-U-N-G-N-E-R. So I always think of it as, remember it like the bunga bunga parties from the, the old Italian prime minister, okay? So that's the way I remember it, Bungner, okay? And so what happens is they basically become neurotropic factors. N-E-U-R-O-T-R-O-P-I-C, neurotropic, which means they guide the direction of growth. They're telling the nerves where to grow into, okay? Then what happens is in the cell body, the nucleus moves to one side and it changes its phenotype from being a neuroconductive phenotype to a neuroregenerative phenotype. So it increases its activity, mitochondria, et cetera, and it becomes a neuroregenerative phenotype. Then in the proximal segment, you start to get outgrowth of these little finger-like projections called filipodia. And these filipodia produce neurotrophic factors, spelt T-R-O-P-H-I-C, which stimulate growth. So at one end, you've got neurotrophic factors, which are stimulating growth. At the other end, you've got neurotropic factors, which are telling it where to grow into. And when the two meet, it's known as a process called contact guidance. So the analogy I think of is a blind man and his cane. The nerves are kind of feeling in the dark where to grow, and the factors are telling them where to grow into. And sometimes that process just stops, and it will end in something called a neuroma. And when that happens, you have to go in and intervene. So classically, Wallerian degeneration is a very predictable process. You typically get a latent period of about two to six weeks. And that's why nerve conduction studies are useless within the first four to six weeks because of this latent period. And then the nerve starts to grow at a rate of one millimeter a day, the same as hair. And clinically, we can monitor that by something called an advancing Tinel sign. Okay, so when you're in the PNI unit, one thing I always do is I always start distally and then work proximally, and I feel for a tinels tapping over it because that will tell me where the, the nerve has grown to. So I can say, okay, it's three months post injury. I can see that the nerve has grown to the mid forearm. I'll see you again in six weeks. I would expect it to have gone, let's say, down to the wrist or whatever it is. Okay, if it is, I'm going to continue to observe. I'm not going to do anything about it. If it doesn't, I may need to go in and explore. Okay, so that's, that's the way to think about it. Keep it nice and simple. And some people say to me, oh, well, Rishi, a true tenel only occurs in a degenerative lesion when the nerve has been cut. So why do we get a tenels in carpal tunnel syndrome? Because that's not a, a degenerative lesion. It's not, the nerve hasn't been cut. It's a conduction block. So what we call that is, they don't say this in any of the books, but it's something called a pseudo tenels. And that's because essentially when the nerve has been compressed for a long period of time, the myelin sheath has melted away. So essentially what you've got here is when you tap on here, you're tapping on exposed growth cones because the myelin sheath has essentially melted away. So it's not a true tenels. It should actually be called a pseudo tenels. Okay. All right. Now, I think this is a, another really important thing to understand is, so a common investigation we order is nerve conduction studies, but a lot of people don't really understand what they are. So I'd really encourage you guys to look at the next time the nerve conduction studies you get and try not to look at the result, just look at it because that's one way they could give you it in the exam. They might give you a picture of a nerve conduction study or they might actually give you a nerve conduction study and say, analyze this. So what do you actually put on a form when you request a nerve conduction study? Well, you request two things. You request the nerve conduction study and you request an EMG. And a nerve conduction study looks at the electrical activity in a nerve, either sensory or motor, whereas the EMG looks at the electrical activity in a muscle. All right. So the nerve conduction study consists of four electrodes, which you can see in this diagram. So you have a stimulating electrode, you have a recording electrode, you have a ground electrode, which essentially earths the patient and stops them being electrocuted, 
and you have a reference electrode, which essentially gets rid of any sort of background interference activity and gives you a nice good trace, okay? So in the case of a sensory nerve, the stimulating electrode will be distal and the recording electrode will be proximal. So it's what we call antidromic impulse transmission. Whereas in the case of a motor nerve, the stimulating electrode is proximal and the recording electrode is distal. So it's called orthodromic stimulation. So this particular case, this is the stimulating electrode and it looks to me like the recording electrode is on the thena eminence. So I think this is probably a median motor nerve because the stimulating electrode is proximal and the recording electrode is distal and it's also on the thena eminence. And that, that would be a reasonable question, guys. They might ask you that in the exam because what they want to see is have you done a nerve conduction study or have you been to a clinic before? That's the stimulating, that's the recording, that's probably either a, probably a reference electrode and that's probably just the ground electrode, okay? Now, the next thing people say to me is, well, how do I actually interpret a nerve conduction study? So you have to know three main parameters, and those are latency, amplitude, and conduction velocity. And the first two parameters are measured directly. The third one is derived, which means you work it out. Okay, so the latency is known as the quality of impulse transmission. It's the time taken to travel between two points, whereas the amplitude is the volume of axons or the quantity of impulse transmission. The conduction velocity, which is in meters per second, the way that you calculate that is you essentially mark two points on the arm and you basically mark one as A, one as B, and then you take a tape measure and you go between those two points. And then you look at the time taken between to go between those two points. So that's another thing you can say in the exam. And it's just a way of showing the examiner that you've been to a nerve conduction study. These are things that they don't say in the books, but these are little tricks that you can put in just to show, because what they want to see in this exam is they want to see clinical experience. They don't want to see just factual knowledge. They want to see clinical experience. So these are little things that you can do. Now, you, do you need to know values for this exam? No. Probably the only one that I would learn is an average value of 50 meters per second. So 60 meters per second for the upper limb, 40 for the lower limb, but on average about 50. But the key thing you do is if they give you a nerve conduction study in the exam, and this is often a trick they will play on you, is they will say, okay, this is a nerve conduction study and it's the left hand. The first thing you say, and this is a pass-fail answer, is you say, I cannot, I, I cannot assess this in isolation. I want to see the right side. And that's because somebody could have an underlying problem like hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. They could have uh, something like MS where they've got universally slowed conduction. But you won't know that until you see both sides in comparison. Does that make sense? So it's not a case of, okay, fine, he's got a nerve conduction, uh, um, conduction velocity of 20 meters per second. He must have a carpal tunnel or a cubital tunnel. That may be normal for him if he's got MS or if he's got hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. So you must ask for the other side. Nerve conduction studies in isolation are meaningless. All right. The second thing you need to know is about how to interpret an EMG. And an EMG is slightly different because in an EMG, you've only got three electrodes, a recording, a ground, and a reference electrode. And that's because the patient provides their own stimulus. So the neurophysiologist will often say to the patient, can you move your thumb for me? Okay, they're doing APB and opponent's polysis. So they are testing the median nerve. So at rest, a nerve conduct, sorry, an EMG should have a flat line. It should have nothing there. The minute you do that, it should suddenly have a motor unit action potential. Okay. However, if you see somebody at rest and the nerve has been cut, you will see lots of little um, uh, V shaped things. And in the early phases, these are. Um, positive things which are called positive sharp waves okay upside down v's and then you get fibrillations later on so not fasciculations guys remember fasciculation is a clinical sign it's twitching you get positive sharp waves and you get fibrillations so that's a sign of denervation okay so then how do we know if the nerve is regenerating how do we know it's coming back to life well 
the analogy that I think of, you get these things called polyphasic units. That's how you know. So the analogy that I think of is the Indian chief and villages. So you've got the chief in village A who's got eight kids and each of those kids represents a muscle or a motor unit and the chief represents a motor nerve. The chief in, in village B has also got eight motor units. Now what happens is when the chief in village A dies, B will take over his kids and his own kids. So instead of supplying eight, he will now supply 16. So as a result, you get a bigger amplitude of stimulus and you get more up and down things which are known as polyphasic units. So polyphasia is a good sign. It's a sign of recovery. So there are two things of recovery. Either clinically, we can look for an advancing Tinel sign or neurophysiologically, we can look for polyphasic units. So a common referral we would have is guys would say, okay, I've done a posterior approach to the hip. I know the sciatic nerve was intact, um, but the patient's got a foot drop. So we would say to them, okay, is there any evidence of hematoma? as in something compressing the nerve, do an ultrasound, okay, no. Is there any pain? No, okay, there is no evidence of ongoing compression. Is there evidence of recovery? So we look for a advancing tunnels and we do a nerve conduction study after six weeks. If we could see polyphasic units, if we could see an advancing tunnels, we would do nothing. We would just observe them over a period of time, okay? Before we move on from nerve conduction studies, I just wanna mention one other thing because a lot of people say to me, oh, well, Rishi, what about H reflex or F waves. They get worried about these things. Now, these are very rarely used in clinical practice. And in the PNI unit, the guys would say they weren't useful at all. But in a nutshell, what happens is the way to think about nerve impulse transmission, although I told you guys orthodromic, antidromic, that implies that nerve transmission only goes one way. It doesn't. It actually goes in two ways. So when you provide a stimulus, the stimulus goes down towards the hand and it goes up towards the neck. All right. So what it does is it basically sends an F wave or a H reflex where it bounces off the top and it comes back and we record that. And that's useful in cases where you cannot get above the lesion, such as a nerve root lesion in the neck. So that's all we use H reflex or F waves for. We do not use them in practice, really. But that's just if the examiner asks you. It's used for cases where you cannot get above the lesion. OK. So the other question that I think is really relevant clinically, and I've kind of alluded to this already, is when do we explore? When do we surgically make the decision to explore with these guys? Well, I've mentioned it. There's two main reasons. Evidence of ongoing compression. And clinically, we can determine that by a patient having pain, either spontaneous or evoked pain. So by that, I mean spontaneous. They've got pain at rest without any stimulus. Evoked means you can lightly stroke the skin, you can tap on it, and they start screaming in pain. Okay, that is a sign of ongoing compression. Or if you do an ultrasound and it shows an expanding hematoma, you will tell the referring center, go back in there and decompress that hematoma. There's not time to refer to the PNI unit, just go in and decompress it. Okay, if they don't have these things, if there is no evidence of recovery, either clinical in the form of an advancing tunnels or neurophysiologically in the form of polyphasic units. So those are your two reasons to do an operation. And what kind of operation do we do? So I've created this thing called the ladder of reconstruction. It's a really nice way, an easy way of thinking about it. So at the most basic level, you start with a neurolysis. You go in there, you remove the hematoma, you remove the scar tissue. And that's useful for people who've had neuropraxia. And actually, with um, the PNI unit, when we had people who would have very severe plexus lesions, they'd go in there, even if the nerve roots were avulsed, the first thing they do is neuralize them and they might do something afterwards, but they do a neurolysis in the most basic level. I remember you can combine procedures together. So if you find that actually the nerve is cut, but the distance between the nerve is such that you could bring it together primarily and repair it without tension, then you can do a direct nerve repair, and that's always the best. But remember, guys, the nerve repair must be done under microscopic guidance, either loops or a microscope, and you must have fascicle to fascicle matching. So a common question they've asked before is, you've cut the carp you do carpal tunnel decompression, you've cut the median nerve, what do you do? And the mistake people make is in the DGH, they go, okay, I'd repair the nerve. I wouldn't say that. I would say I would tag the two nerve ends and my justification for doing that is because I need, first of all, the training, microscopic guidance, but secondly, I need fascicle to fascicle matching. 
And if you do not have the skill set to do that, you're not doing the patient the best service. And I remember always used to advise, tag the two nerve ends, do not attempt to repair them. Okay. If you find that actually, do you know what? Um, and I've actually, I've missed out one there. What I should have said is if you find that actually there is a gap between the two ends, because remember when you do a nerve repair or a nerve expiration, you have to take off the, the serrated bits, the inflamed bits or whatever, the damaged bits, you can't just repair end to end. So once you've excised the two bits, if you find actually you can't bring them together without tension, you can actually put a nerve graft and that nerve graft could be something like a sural nerve an intercostal nerve or some sort of sensory nerve, or it could be synthetic. Okay. If you find that actually the gap is too big, even with graft, you may have to do something called a nerve transfer where you take a nerve, which is less useful elsewhere. And you basically transfer it to supply function. And I think there's three main transfers that you should know for the exam. Okay. So if somebody has, let's say a upper trunk injury or a, um, a, 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 a yeah, like a C5, C6, your three priorities there is you basically want to restore shoulder stability. So you want to get the suprascapular nerve. So I would normally take the spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve. Okay. Secondly, I want to restore shoulder movement in the form of deltoid. So I do what's called a SOMSAC transfer, S-O-M-S-A-K. And I'm taking a branch of the um, radial nerve, which supplies the triceps, and I'm putting it into the auxiliary nerve. And finally, I want to restore elbow flexion. So I do what's called an Oberlin transfer, O-B-E-R-L-I-N. And I take a branch of SCU or FCR supplied by the median, sorry, supplied by the ulna or median nerve respectively. And I plumb that into the muscular cutaneous. I wouldn't learn any other nerve transfers. Those are the three that I think just remember those for the exam. And that's if you're going for a seven or an eight. So don't panic, all right? Um, obviously, the next thing is with the first three things, you have a certain period of time. The books say one year, but I would say in reality about six months to a year. And that's because after a period of time, the motor units will die. So even if you restore nerve function, you've got nothing to innovate. So in those cases, you do what's called a tendon transfer, where you basically take a functioning muscle tendon unit and you take it into one that's not functioning very well. And finally, you do what's called a free muscle transfer, where you, it's like a free flap in plastics. And you need plastic surgeons to do this, where you're essentially taking a muscle from somewhere else. So you might even take something like gastroc or gracilis or whatever it is, and you basically take it with its pedicle and you plumb it into the area. Okay, but that's really high end stuff. So that is the ladder of reconstruction. I would learn that as a, a, a way of treating everything, guys. And I think you can't go wrong with that, really. Okay, so tendon transfers, I'm just going to very briefly, just to end my talk, say something about tendon transfers. Okay, so with tendon transfers, I've got a really good way of remembering these. Rather than memorizing the tendon transfers, guys, in the exam, I break it up into four bits. I say, what is your deficit? What, actually three bits, what is your surgical priority? And what are your options? And that way, what they want to see in this exam, remember I told you, it's clinical application. It's not memorizing it okay so they want to see does this guy or girl does she have did they have the sort of wherewithal to understand the principles okay so what's your deficit let's say somebody's got a um a let me think of one let's say they've got a um a low radial uh, sorry, no, no, let's say they've got a low median nerve palsy okay so their deficit there they've essentially got it's an anatomy question all right so we know where the median nerve runs the median nerve doesn't give any branches in the upper arm. It basically starts to give branches in the um, forearm. It gives off four branches for the common flexors, FCR, FDS, pulmonis longus, and pronated teres. It then gives off three branches, anterior interosseous nerve to FPL, FDP to index and middle, and pronated quadratus. And then it basically gives off your loaf muscles and sensory to the radial three and a half digits, and also a palmar cutaneous branch. So with a low median nerve palsy, Basically, you've just lost your loaf muscles. That's your deficit. And you've lost sensation to the radial three and a half digits. What is your surgical priority? So your surgical priority with a low median nerve palsy is restoring opposition. Okay. And then what are your options? So with a low palsy, your options are for an opponent's plasty. You can either use um, palmaris longus. You can use EIP. You can use FDS to the ring. Or you can use uh, abductor digiti minimi, known as a Huber's transfer. Okay, 
Although remember, that's the pediatric transfer because you lose 75% of the strength. Now, the problem with the high median nerve palsy is this time you've essentially got your surgical priority here is opposition, but you've also lost thumb flexion because you've lost FPL, okay, and you've also lost FPB, okay, and you've also lost finger flexion to these ones because you've lost FDS and FDP with a high median nerve injury. So this time your surgical priority is restoring thumb flexion, finger flexion to these two, and opposition. So what are your options? Well, for opposition, you can't use pulmaris longus because that's gone with a high median nerve palsy. You can't lose SVS because that's gone. You can't use abductor digiti minimi because it's a pediatric transfer. So your only option is EIP. Okay. For thumb flexion, you can use brachioradialis. And for finger flexion, you can basically buddy the FDPs from the older ones and basically have like a mass movement like that. So always break it up into what is your deficit? What is your surgical priority? And what are your options? Okay. And finally, the principles of tendon transfers. Now, I have to tell a very quick, funny story if you guys don't mind me. So I was crashing and burning on one of my um, questions in the exam, and I was desperate to get in principles of tendon transfer. It was like a running joke, because in my revision sessions, I would try and get principles of tendon transfers into every single thing. So I kept saying to someone, to the examiner, I was like, they were like, well, what are you going to do for it? And I said, well, there's a number of things you can op offer, such as tendon transfers, which have a number of important principles. And she didn't, she didn't take the bait. And then again, I say, so I could do tendon transfers, which have many important principles. Again, she didn't take the bait. So I think she just got bored of me saying it. So she's like, okay, tell me about the principles of tendon transfer. So, so the key thing is everybody goes on about the eight S's, um, which I think is in one of the books. Now this question, I subdivided it. And I said, the principles of tendon transfer can be divided into patient, donor, bed, and recipient factors. And she literally ticked it and said, move on. So patient factors would be things like, is the patient sufficiently motivated to do the rehab? Are they able to do the rehab? Donor factors would be, is it a sacrificable donor? Does it have sufficient power? At least MRC grade four out of five, because remember you drop an MRC grade. Um, uh, same line of pull, et cetera. So what I'm doing is I'm saying this eight S's, but I'm just subdividing them into those different parts in case I miss one out. So it's just a nice way of doing it. And it's that whole thing of compartmentalization that I was saying to you guys. So finally, we've got some common scenarios. And I think, um, Firas, did you want to, me to offer these as Viva questions to people? Or I, I think if, uh, if you don't mind, we could run yeah. it as a Viva yeah, practice. And if you could, at the end, give us your model answers for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think people will find it useful. Give them opportunity to practice with you. Brilliant. Uh, so um, I think... Um, so you finished your um, I finished. yeah sorry guys if that was a bit long uh, no it was very perfect wonderful wasn't that uh, was um, you know um spot on actually yeah and um, I, hope, I hope i've not scared you too much because i'm trying to keep this simple as remember it's called basic science it's not called complex science so it's all about keeping your principles really simple for this exam and stuff so. thank you Richard. i think uh, this was very interesting um a very high standard uh, presentation as expected from you you made this uh, um, dry topic very interesting. You, <laughs> it's, you brought it. You brought the clinical significance of of the basic sciences behind the nerves um, into our clinical practice, and that's exactly the higher order thinking that we're trying to implement in our teaching. Exact how you transfer this dry um, theoretical knowledge uh, into a clinical practice. Uh, and that, that's exactly the, the level they they looking for in FRCS um, candidate. A lot of buzzwords there in the lecture, um, more than I can count. Um, so I think that we have to revisit every candidate, have to re uh, listen to this, learn all these saltatory conduction, yeah. all this mnemonic dating me, and um, I, I think that's very useful, especially when you get stuck in the question and you don't know what to do. Just remembering these buzzwords. This mnemonic could get you out of um, trouble sometimes. Um, so, uh, and, and, and actually this ladder of reconstruction you present that day is actually, um, it's, it's worth gold really. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an amazing one. So I think um, any, any um, in terms of uh, questions, I think um, you, you covered really everything about nerves. I think people will just uh, um, 
have to to look at this lecture again. Uh, but um, any comments from um, any of the mentors? Um, any uh, anyone wants to add anything? Um, no, it's a really well presented uh, topic. It's a very uh, broken down into its basic uh, from very complex topic to very very easy topic to understand now. Um, uh, just a reminder to all the candidates that in the exam, don't be frightened by something that looks complex um, because often the patients that are coming with nerve injury have already had a number of procedures done to them. They're well known to the examiners uh, who are organizing the exam. So they've got lots of nerves, lots of different things happening. Just take a calm breath, start at the basic and move forward from there, especially in clinical sessions. Yeah, I think I think Shimon, as you said, is um, what you have to remember is when when we get a break. Let's say a brachial plexus injury is an example. When that comes in a PNI clinic, we get thirty minutes with that patient, okay. And by the end of the thirty minutes, we often don't have the diagnosis. We often have to do nerve conduction studies. We have to bring them back. So what they're looking for in the exam, they're not looking for a, a perfect diagnosis in five minutes. They want, they want look, have, can you do a general impression, a, just a general overlook? Is this a plexus injury? Does it look like it's, it's a high or a low plexus lesion? And what investigations might I do? And just a generic impression. Will I do the same thing, basically? That's what they're looking for. So to, I, I, as Sean said, I think it's very important. Just keep nice and relaxed, keep calm, and just keep it really, really simple in terms of general, general principles. And, can I can I mention an experience recently by one of my colleagues who just had the exam and he felt that question. He had a nerve con, a nerve uh, injury uh, exam, clinical, and he because he knew that they will end up with a um, uh, tendon transfer, so he jumped all the steps and immediately jumped into the the tendon transfer, mm -hmm. and then he made himself a big 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 you know hole and dug himself into it and buried himself. Yeah. And I really like this ladder of, of uh, 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 management, which is really good if everyone stick to that. So you always start by the simple methods and you slowly make your way up. I really like that. Yeah, you have to remember that you can't get an eight before you can get a six. I, and I, I have had guys coming up to me and they're like, Rishi, I don't understand why I failed. They got me onto management. I got onto evidence. But the reason why you failed is because the six is always the safety question. So unless you've demonstrated safety first, and safety would be assessing this patient appropriately, assessing them clinically, getting appropriate investigations, they, will, they, they might let you jump to the end, but you won't have done well on that question. So don't just assume because you got onto evidence that you've automatically done well on that station. Yeah, cover the basics. The exam is all about uh, level uh, a DGH first day consultant. It's not about uh, P, uh, peripheral nerve injury unit uh, consultant level professor work. Lovely. So uh, if you, everyone is happy, um, we will move on to the Viva section. Um, we have Atif um, who has uh, volunteered to go first. This is a 48-year-old manual laborer who's been having some difficulty with his hands. He's complaining of dropping things. He's come to see you in your hand clinic. Okay. I mean, this is, this is a tactic that I often use and I tell trainees about is I kind of, stop, to stop myself from slowing down in the viber and, and getting bogged down, because I felt that you were getting bogged down a bit then, yeah. is I almost, I almost think of it as like, you're driving along Route 66 and you're trying to get to the rainbow at the end, which is the eight. And having the mind in the back of your mind, where do I need to get to, to get the eight? What is the final question they're going to ask you? And a tip is in the nerve conduct, in any nerve question, whatever it is, the final question is always going to be tendon transfers. It's always going to be. Okay. So you needed to get to the opponent's plasty to get to the, the eight. So, so you need to have, find a way of getting through it very quickly. So description. So I, I divide it up into what I call the, the five Ds of deer, which is describe, diagnose, discuss, decide, and diagram. So describe is your opening gambit. The first thing that comes out of your mouth is determined if you've got a five, six, or a six, seven. So this is a clinical photograph of both hands, which shows bilateral femur muscle wasting or thena eminence wasting. You said APB. We don't know if it's APB. It's thena eminence wasting, yeah. which is asymmetrical, worse on the right compared to the left. Okay? That, that's what you say first of all. All right? So that's described. Diagnosis. Okay? I suspect that this is a bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, worse on the right compared to the left. 
But because there's bilateral involvement, I would want to check for a central involvement by checking the cervical spine, okay? Describe, diagnose, discuss. What are your concerns and how would you go about addressing those concerns? So I break it up into like a, a triple assessment, clinical, radiological, biochemical, and neurophysiological, all right? So I kind of think it to myself. I think of, imagine you're driving along the road and you've got bits of shit on the side of the road. You want to acknowledge the shit, but you don't want to get stuck in it, all right? So that's why you want to find a quick way of saying history, examination, investigations. So you said I would take a history. Don't say that. Say I would take a pertinent history asking this, 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 and this. And I always break it up into a risk factor history and a condition history. So how is the condition affecting them? Have they had conservative treatments? What, um, and then risk factor history, hypothyroidism, manual activity, pregnancy, etc. All right. There's not really any imaging you can offer these guys. So you then say I would do a neurophysiological assessment and I would look for a prolonged conduction study and also a um, uh, prolonged, prolonged conduction velocity and increased latency across the wrists. That's the buzzword I was looking for. If you look at conduction studies, they always say wrist and elbow. Okay. And then finally, you want to get on to the operation. So that's the fourth D, decide. So describe, diagnose, discuss, decide. Okay, and that's going to be talking through the layers. So in an appropriately marked consent of patient, supine with an arm table, tourniquet, and infiltration of local anesthetic to the carpal tunnel, I would mark out four lines. Okay, so you want to say the lines. Kaplan's cardinal line from the base of the abducted thumb to the hook of the hamate, which I do not want to go distal to because it marks the deep palmar arch. The distal skin crease, which I do not want to go proximal to because of the palmar cutaneous nerve, the radial border of the ring finger, which marks the line of the carpal tunnel, and the radial border, sorry, radial border of the ring finger, and the radial border of the middle finger, which marks the recurrent branch of the median nerve. Okay, and then you just say, I would dissect through skin fat coming onto the flexor retinaculum. I would make a small nick in a tearing sensation. Use words that show that you've done it before until I can just visualize the median nerve. And then I would use a McDonald's and under direct vision, I would release the nerve proximally and distally and just close skin at the end. Okay. And then the last thing they'll say to you is, okay, the patient comes back. They've had no improvement in their function. What are you going to do? And that would be tendon transfers, opponents plastic. So I think those five D's, sorry, the last D I should have said is diagram, detective, or discussion point. So your discussion point can be, for, and I use that, those five D's for every FRCS question. It really helps me in my um, structure of those, so. Yeah, thank you. That just helps. That's brilliant. Um, if I could add, uh, Atif, the, um, you did exactly what Risha had said. Uh, you, you got bogged down. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would ask, I would ask. It's not, not a problem, but there are personal questions that you need to know to help you diagnose and manage this patient. But when Risha said, what are you going to do? You did the right thing, but it's a joint decision-making process. That's fine, but you don't need to repeat it a second time. He wasn't tricking you. The examiner right. doesn't want to hear that, and they'll move on. Then they're asking what you're going to advise. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. And yes, you do have to discuss all options, including non-operative versus thing. The reality is, Risha said, what are you going to advise? It's just, it just means you're less less responding to a prompt yeah. yeah i think it's the same i was uh, at the same point like he mentioned the same question three times so that means he wants to take you to the surgical route so why wait yes and i think i think i think exactly as he said to me is um as i said is that in this patient here i agree with you shared decision making of course but as a surgeon if you've got thena muscle wasting and severe changes you want to get in there quickly because otherwise they're going to have a non-functioning hand. So that's why I was trying to push you just to say, actually, yes, of course you will consult the patient, but in this particular case, I would advise to do this, this, and this. It's like if I saw a Dupuytren's patient who's got a diastasis or who has a PIPJ contracture of more than 20, 30 degrees, I would say, look, yes, we could try conservative measures first, but in this case, I know it has a very high risk of recurrence, it has a very poor response to conservative management, so I'd probably rec recommend surgery in this particular patient. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well done. Um, and that was just taking you guys to medium nerve anatomy. We don't need to go through that. They'll probably ask you about carpal tunnel anatomy if you're doing very well. Yeah. Okay.
And that, sorry, if, if you, what I was going to get onto is if you did really well is where can the median nerve be compressed with a high median nerve palsy? So I've got a little mnemonic flats, FPS, aponeurosis, ligament and struthers, aponeurosis, biceps, prenisteries, supracondylar process. So you can learn that if you, if you want the exam. Okay. And just to remind you, sorry, everyone, sorry um, I really have to emphasize this. If it's an easy topic that you can day a day up, it's bread and butter work for you. It, you need to know these details really well. Okay. Yeah. The, the operation needs to be described perfectly, the management, the investigations, all of that just needs to be perfect because the more common the operation is, the more in depth they're going to ask you. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes the difficult ones are the easiest ones to score eight, eights on because um, you don't have to say much. Okay. Um, welcome uh, welcome uh, to your uh, FRCS exam. Thank you. This is a Viva table um, and um, Rishi is your examiner. He has a question for you. Okay. Hi, Hi Jerry. So this is a, um, this is a 35 year old gentleman who came off a motorbike and did this injury a week ago. He's now come to your fracture clinic. This is his clinical appearance on the left, and these are some radiographs that you got on the right. Good things there. There was a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you, your, your initial description I thought was very good. You, you, um, you, you, you described Holstein Lewis. You got the diagnosis very well. Um, can you keep... Okay, so initial description, you got... You, you described it well, but you just wasted too much time. Okay, so just let literally say this is a clinical photograph of a wrist drop and an AP radiograph of the right humerus, which shows a Holstein Lewis fracture at the junction of the middle and distal thirds. This is a suspected yeah. radial nerve palsy. Just say describe diagnosis nice and quick. All right. Yeah. Then what you need to do is you need to get through that third D. You're you're getting stuck in the shit. Okay. So yeah. just describe it in terms of a triple assessment: clinical, radiographic, and neurophysiological. Okay. Mm -hmm. What you want to say is clinically, as you said, you want to find out about comorbidities, level of function, um, dominance, occupation, etc. But you also want to know about if there's any evidence of iatrogenic injury, which is what I was, which is what you said, which is fine. But I, but I had to prompt you a little bit. So you need to say, look, if it's been there after they did the splint, it means it's iatrogenic injury and the nerve is entrapped and it obligates expiration. Okay. Yeah. So, other things you look for clinically is, as you said, you could look for advancing tunnels. I wouldn't expect to see that after a week. You could also look for pain and you could look for swelling as well, which is a sign of ongoing compression. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, radiologically, you talked about, and neurophysiologically, it's useless before six weeks because of a latency period, but you can mention it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, now, you mentioned about you got into a controversial area and the Holstein Lewis fracture is, is very regularly asked because it trips people up. And this question about whether you fix it or don't fix it, I agree with you. So Giannoudis' paper showed that 90% of cases the nerve recovers in three months. But the problem with that is we, the way to say this is we don't really care about the nerve injury. And if it's not iatrogenic, we know it's going to recover. But the problem with these is in 30% of cases, because of the deforming force of triceps, they basically go into malunion or they get incredibly stiff elbows. So a way to avoid the controversy is to say, look, this is a young, active patient. I deliberately made him young for you, 35. Um, you say, I would counsel the patient. I would expect the nerve injury to recover. I know that they recover in 90% of the cases. So my decision-making is based upon the fracture. And I know with these distal third fractures, because of the deforming force of triceps, they have a high rate of malunion and they get elbow stiffness. So my rationale would be to fix this to allow early mobilization of the elbow. Because what you do is you tell me, okay, fine, I'm gonna get nerve conduction studies, I'm gonna do serial examination. So I'll say to you, okay, it's three weeks. What are you gonna do now? Okay, I'll examine him again. Okay, it's six weeks. And you said I wouldn't even do nerve conduction studies for three months. So you're just gonna keep going and going and going. And it's what I call a lot of risk for very little reward. It's like the, the pink pulseless hand in the supracondylar fracture. Yes, we know that that can wait till the next morning, but the new BOSE guidelines have said, if there's any evidence of impaired vascularity, including pulselessness, take them in the middle of the night. So it's a way to sidestep the controversy because what you want to think to yourself is, I need to get onto the operation. I need to get onto posterior approach. I need to get onto 
plating, extra articular locking plate. I need to get on to tendon transfers. If you're not going near that, you're not scoring a seven at all. And you're lucky to score a six. So you've got to think, how do I get through that initial crap as quick as possible? By one and a half minutes, you should be in theatre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So little things like triple assessments, like talking about clinical and neurophysiological, that, that just gets you through that crap as quick as possible and sidestepping the controversies. I mean, what do you guys think? Is that, is that fair or? I think, I think yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the only, only concern I always have, with, because I've seen this among some of the uh, guys who are preparing for exams, and they've come back and said this to me after they've done the exams, is that in their push to get to the tendon transfer, they didn't cover the basics. And yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, yeah. You must get to that level of discussion, yeah. but cover the basics well. But cover the basics well, yeah. 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 A common question, Holstein Lewis, that came up in my yeah. exam. Uh, because, mm -hmm. it, because it's an area that can trip people up, they want a question that is potentially controversial, that can, because uh, it, it does discriminate. This discriminates between someone who is six and an eight. It's a good discriminatory question. So, um, sorry, did you wanted to? Oh, yeah, <coughs> uh, the uh, same extra can be asked in a, in, a, in a basic science table or in a, in, a, in a trauma table. So we need to be mindful of which table it's going to be asked because if it's at a basic science table, they're probably going to take into bone healing or nerve injuries. So we shouldn't spend a lot of time describing the X-rays. We need to catch the bait, go into that first. But in case it's a trauma table, then we need to. Um, imagine as if we are seeing on day one and these questions need to be to uh, to be answered without the examiner asking like day one what are you going to do you're going to leave a splint or contractures when, when you're going to do next when you're going to see the patient next at the six week mark and at that time what are you going to do and next when you're going to see next so it should be like a sequence thing as if you're seeing in a clinic and that should come without the examiner prompting you yeah. so that's the important bit that I want to add uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I agree with Ranjit. I think with these common predictable scenarios, it is possible that you could talk the whole five minutes uh, without having the examiner have to ask you many questions. Um, uh, this is one of those predictable scenarios where you could just take the examiner from clinical representation history into the further the management. You know, you know what they're getting to, and that's I think the level uh, required for the FRCS. Um, you could just take the examiner through the whole journey um, easily. Um, but um, yeah, that's what I want to say. Yes. Thank you, Ranjit. Yeah, I agree with you. Grateful to, to and lo lovely students and thank welcome to all the guys who volunteered. It's not an easy yeah. thing. You know, lots of courage and that's good. I like that. That's a really good attitude as well. So yeah, I encourage everyone to try to to come forward. Thank you very much, Sharishi. We appreciate uh, your presence. Uh, We're very privileged and. Um, Guys, thank you very much for having me. I'm really grateful and, and uh, yeah, really lovely session. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rishia. We hope, uh, you. we know you are very busy with your clinical practice and with your courses and teaching, but uh, we would love to have you again. Um, yeah, I, know, I would love to. Man. It's an absolute pleasure. It was really enjoyable and, and well done once again for those guys volunteering. That's a really difficult thing to do, but keep doing it because it'll help you a lot. Thank you, Rishi, for being with us uh, this evening, and hopefully we look forward to seeing you again. Thank all the mentors, Shwan, Abdullah, uh, Fuad, Ranjit, uh, Anwar, um, for being here. Um, we appreciate your input, and uh, we'll see you guys again um, next time, uh, next week, next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.